chat with each other, have to answer whatever we can and as much as we can. So thank you everyone for joining. My name is Desi and I am head of community and coach success here at Keras. Here today with me is Rich Hutton and we'll be talking about the three things you need to be aware of before you go to a job interview. Uh, we'll be demystifying behavioral interviews. Uh, I already mentioned earlier, we are going to begin with a quick presentation where Rich is going to talk for the next 15 to 20 minutes. And afterwards, we're going to switch to a Q&A session. So you have the opportunity to ask Rich questions. Tomorrow, one of our attendees has a job interview scheduled with Apple. So he'll get the opportunity to ask Rich one question. Let's get started, Rich. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Desi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for taking some time out of your day to, to join us here this afternoon uh, or this morning, depending where you are uh, in the world. Uh, like Desi mentioned, my name is Rich Hutton. Uh, I'm a coach on Karis, uh, specializing in behavioral interviewing and offer negotiations. Um, I have been a former hiring manager and recruiter uh, at companies like Apple, IBM, a company called Gartner as well. Uh, and so today, like she mentioned, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be kind of giving you a, a brief overview of some of the three key things that you need to be aware of and should be very mindful of when it comes to behavioral interviews. Um, nowadays, basically every company in the world in some way, shape or form has a behavioral interview part of their hiring process, even for more technical positions, think data scientists, data analysts, etc. Um, they all have it in some way, shape or form, whether they admit to it and they say it openly, hey, this is a behavioral interview or if they're just looking at it passively while you know just having a general conversation with you. These are all things that they're looking for. So in terms of talking points, right? Why are you guys here today? Uh, ultimately, hopefully you're here if you're wondering, you know, is there a secret tip to being successful in an interview? Has it been a while uh, since you last interviewed? Maybe you need to kind of a brush up uh, or refresher, so to speak. Um, are you just generally curious about what FANG, and for those who don't know, FANG being Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google companies uh, are looking for in behavioral interviews? And just as a side, this applies to all of the companies as well. Um, are you worried uh, that you might have some technical expertise but can't quite get your message across to the hiring manager? Um, all of these things are completely valid questions, which a lot of people ask. Uh, clients that I have asked in, in sort of behavioral interview training, and they're all very valid, right? Uh, this is not something which is a perfect science. I have yet to, out of thousands of candidates that I've spoken with, found anyone who is perfect at behavioral interviewing. I'm not perfect when I interview uh, for roles. Uh, I'll fully admit to that. But the reality is that through practice, through getting help with a coach, through understanding these three principles that we're going to talk through today, this is going to make you feel more confident, hopefully, at the end of it. Um, and hopefully, it'll actually encourage you to actually seek out and get a coach. Uh, coaches can be super helpful. Um, they are great, safe places to practice, to get feedback without jeopardizing potentially your, your future job, right, during an interview. So really encourage everyone here to at least have a, an introductory call with myself or any other of the great coaches um, that we have uh, on Karis. So like I said, three key things that we're going to be talking about today here. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, here are what we're looking at. Uh, the three, key, three keys to success sound obvious, but the reality is, in my experience, a lot of people don't do them very well, right? So let's start off with here. You got answering the question, delivering confidently, and less is more. So what do they mean? Well, in a nutshell, answering the question again, it sounds fairly obvious, but to a lot of people, it's actually harder than it seems. A lot of times people will overanalyze the question. They will think to themselves, oh, it's a, it's a trick question. Um, I don't really, I know what they're asking for. I'm gonna go down this long rabbit hole here of, um, you know, telling about my life story. I'm going to talk nonstop for seven minutes about how great of a candidate I am and why they should obviously choose me. Um, that is not usually the best way to approach this. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit more. Second one is delivering confidently, um, ideally in a structured manner. So hopefully some of you uh, may be familiar with or have heard about uh, the STAR technique for, for answering questions. So situation, task, action, result. There are other variations of this as well. Um, PAR is another one that I've heard of before. 
problem, issue, uh, action, result, et cetera. So we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of what a, a structured answer actually looks like. And then less is more. Less is more is I would say 98, 99% of all the candidates I work with, all the candidates I've ever spoken with, frankly, have an issue when it comes to being too long-winded. Uh, you, you think that the entire purpose is to tell as much as you possibly can to the interviewers about yourself, about your experiences. The reality is you actually want to, to keep that quite condensed because you want to create a little bit of curiosity in yourself and you want them to ask you additional follow-up questions. And so we'll kind of dig into that a little bit more um, as well. So if you wanna to go to the next slide here, we're gonna talk a little bit about the interview, right? What is the behavioral interview? What is the process here? Well, hiring is a matching game and uh, kudos and shout out to another great coach on the platform, uh, Teresa Fung, who, who kind of put this slide together for another webinar that we did previously. Uh, the reality is here, understanding what hiring is, it is a matching game in terms of what the, uh, the hiring manager, what the recruiter, uh, whoever it is that is out, has the open position is looking for and whether or not you have those experiences. And again, this sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised at how many people do not understand that this is what we're actually looking for here. Most of the needs that you are going to need to talk about or express, excuse me, most of the needs that the hiring manager is looking for that you need to talk about and express and show that you have experiences in are in the job description. Read the job description. Again, this sounds like, oh yeah, Bill Rich, why did I hear at a webinar to hear you tell me to read the job description? Well, because job descriptions actually give a lot more information than a lot of candidates realize. And if you apply to a role and you don't have some, most of, half of the things that they're looking for in the job description, they're not going to get back to you. Why? Well, right now, the marketplace is a really hot candidate marketplace. That means that there's a lot of people looking for a lot of roles out there. And therefore, you know, I personally, and when I have had a role open uh, relatively recently, in four days, I had over 600 applicants for a position. As a recruiter, I really at times don't have the time to go through all 600 applicants. And chances are, when I find someone that actually has exactly what I need, I'm going to talk to them because I have a lot of candidates to look for versus someone who only has half of what I need. So all this is to say, it's really important to actually read the job description, understand the job description, and be prepared to speak to all of the bullet points or topics that they are talking about in that job description. It takes time, it takes effort, but it's really gonna help you stand out uh, when looking at all the other candidates. But there are other things that um, aren't in the job description that hiring managers and recruiters, I'm just gonna bucket those together and call them the interviewers are looking for. These can be things like your ability to actually communicate your experiences. Um, can you build rapport in the interview and in the conversation? Prime example, uh, it happens way too often, but I'll, you know, welcome to a conversation. Hi, my name is Rich. How are you doing today? I'm good. And it's like crickets. Oh, okay, well, immediately, if I'm looking for someone who can communicate, I'm kind of put off because you're not building any rapport with me. Even if you're nervous, even if you're unsure, still make the effort. These are things which aren't in the job description, but I guarantee you that hiring managers and interviewers are actually looking for. They also might be looking for things like being able to ask some deep and challenging questions. Are you curious? Do you like to learn new things? And so again, these aren't necessarily things that are gonna be the third bullet point in the job description, but you need to be aware of these things. You need to make sure that you have the ability to say, okay, well, they're probably gonna want someone curious because Apple's a really curious company. They're very innovative. They're good at problem solving. Maybe I should take a little bit extra time to prepare some great questions to ask the interviewer um, during the conversation. So these are just kind of some of the things just to overall think about when it comes to, to hiring, right, and in a behavioral interview. So if we go to the next slide, uh, let's now dig into to the, uh, my favorite one, frankly, which is uh, answering the question, right? And, and making sure that you are truly able to figure out what it is they're asking from you and that you give an answer that they are looking for. So these are some examples here of, of questions that uh, I have had experience with, with candidates saying that they get stumped by. They have no idea how to answer them. Or I'll ask this question as like a benchmark to my candidates when I first meet them or clients even when I first meet them and get a sense of kind of what their reaction is. So 
let's start off with the first one, right? Why Apple? So this again, it sounds pretty straightforward or why any other company for that matter? It sounds pretty straightforward, right? So I had a candidate to kind of share an experience with you. I had a candidate not long ago who, who told me that this is a question that they're very well prepared for. So I said, great, awesome, let's go for it, mock interview. Why do you want to join us here at Apple? Why Apple, why this company? And they started off by telling me how they had 15 years of experience in this industry, why he's the best candidate for the role, how he's increased productivity by 25%. That's not the question. That has nothing to do with the question that I asked the person. It was, why Apple? The question is, why do you want to work for Apple? Why have you chosen out of all the companies that there are to choose from, why are you sitting in front of me today for an interview for Apple? Therefore, your answer should probably be very specific to why you're choosing to speak with us and interview here at Apple. How do you do this? Make it personal, right? Tie it into the core beliefs and fundamentals of Apple as an organization. Again, for an example here, what do you know about Apple? Well, we all know it's a very innovative company. Um, they put the client at the center of their universe, their products and their software. So the hardware and software merges together to create an experience. So what do you believe in, in terms of the same ethics that they do? Do you also put the client at the center of your universe and whatever it is that you're doing? Do you also love the way in which they protect privacy and that they are kind of going against the trend of just using data for advertising and marketing perspectives, things like that? Really speak to why it is that you are wanting to work for Apple specifically, not all about your backgrounds and things like that. So the other thing to think about here is, Google is a great place, uh, and I don't mean that to work, but it is, uh, but I'm talking about, you know, the actual search capabilities, the internet, let's just call it, is a great place. Do not Google search, how should I answer why Apple, click on the first result, and then use that as your answer. I guarantee you there's probably 5,000 other people who are doing the exact same thing, and all the effort that you put into doing the research is going to go to nothing, right? Make it truly personal to yourself because at the end of the day, when you think about Apple as a company, it's a personal company. They want to truly understand and change your life. That is why I joined Apple. That is the experience I had at Apple. That is probably why you want to join Apple. So talk about that, right? Next one, why this role? Again, believe it or not, this question is still not asking about you. I do not want to hear about all your years of experiences right off the bat, at least. This is a question which is checking to understand what research have you done about this position? Have you read the job description, which hopefully because I told you to, you're now going out and all reading the job descriptions of the roles that you're applying for. Have you looked into the company more than just surface level? Do you understand how this role ties into the greater ecosystem of the organization? This is what they're looking for. Now, this is very different though to the prior question, which was why Apple? That is asking about why the company. This is saying, now, what do you know about this role? And out of the 12,000 positions that are open at Apple right now, that's a guess, I don't know how many there are, why are you choosing this one versus that one? So this is now really where you want to highlight your research and skills and the effort that you've done to understand this position. A product manager at Splunk is different from a product manager at Apple, which is different from a product manager at Google, believe it or not. That is what they're looking for here. So. What would a good answer to this question look like? Um, you know, I'm really interested in this role because based on what I've read and found in my research, uh, this is a leadership role which can truly transform the way we do business with our end user clients. The fact that this role sits in between uh, our marketing and our procurement uh, you know, organizations means that there'll be multiple competing stakeholders all looking for different ways to do work. But Given my prior five years experience working exclusively within the marketing and the procurement space, I believe that my ability to manage uh, you know, the senior stakeholders in an organization like this will make me a great asset to this role. However, having said that, and based on all the research that I've already done, I would still really like to use this opportunity in this interview to learn a little bit more about the role. Okay, so that has proven that you've done the research. That's proven that you've kind of taken the step a little bit further and you're trying to understand the position where it sits in the organization. You're not just someone who's hit apply and then just kind of walked away from the position. That's really important. So hopefully you guys are kind of getting a sense of where I'm leading to here, right? These questions are actually black and white for the most part. It's just 
people tend to overcomplicate them or not think or think that we're trying to ask a trick question when we're really not. The next one, and, and I know this is the slide I'm going to take the longest on, but there's a reason because it's the most important. What are your weaknesses? This is a question that challenges so many people, specifically those individuals who come from backgrounds or even cultures where they might not think it's appropriate to actually highlight your deficiencies, uh, to highlight your weaknesses, what you're not very good at. But what we're actually looking for here is we're looking for, as an interviewer, your ability to be vulnerable, your ability to be humble, your ability to um, showcase a, a skill or a competency or an ability that you have actually worked hard on improving because at one point or another, you weren't actually that good at it. So guess what you need to do for this? You need to actually tell them what your weaknesses are. This is not the time when you say, actually, no, I don't have any weaknesses. I'm actually pretty good at my job. You're going to come across arrogant. Uh, the hiring manager is probably going to think, oh, you think you're better than me? Um, you're not going to come across like you're vulnerable at all. The reality is you actually want to showcase the fact that you know not everyone is perfect. You know that you have things to work on. And for bonus points, you want to highlight what you have actually improved upon. You know, for me, uh, one of my biggest weaknesses was actually, you know, going uh, too headstrong into conversations with my stakeholders. I would just go in with a solution uh, and sometimes I kind of jumped the gun and it would mean that we would get something wrong down the line and we have to go back and start all over again. But what I can tell you is, um, you know, recently I've been trying to really slow down my approach, make sure I'm asking a lot of deep questions to kind of understand what is it that the stakeholders are truly looking for, taking some time, processing that, and taking a little bit longer to then present a better solution than just going headstrong. And the reality is I've actually done that. And, you know, here's an example actually of a time where I've been able to do this briefly. There you go, right? You've been able to showcase a weakness and at the same time highlight an area um, where you have been uh, improving upon. I hope that's helpful. Desi, any questions that have come through so far that I can help kind of uh, take off the plate? Yeah, in fact, there are a few questions that I go think uh, fit really well the slide with questions. Everyone ignore what you're seeing right now. Uh, it's the next slide. I'm going to switch to questions we've already received in the chat. Uh, so let me just make sure I'm not missing anybody. From your point of view, Rich, what is the most complicated behavioral question to answer? Um, most complicated, but that's a good question. Uh, I'd say the most complicated behavioral interview question to ask answer is, um, why are you looking to make a move from your current company? Um, this is one that actually does take a little bit of practice and thought in terms of how you craft your answer. Look, we all know reasons why people leave, right? You don't like your boss. Um, you've been passed up for promotion. Um, the company's kind of looking a little shaky right now. You're not quite convinced you're going to be there for a long period of time. So, so these are this is a question where you don't necessarily want to lead with the blunt truth, shall we say? You don't want to go into an interview and saying, I really don't like my boss. They're not very nice to me. I don't get on well with them. You don't want to go that aggressive. But what you probably do want to do is you want to think about the greater picture and, and how you tell your story. And so for that example, right, let's say you're not getting along well with your boss, right? Your boss is micromanaging you, something like that. Your answer to that question could be, well, you know, right now, kind of the way in which I'm seeing the culture of my current organization just doesn't really match up with, with what I feel I need to be the most productive or the most efficient version of myself. You know, what I'm really looking for is I'm looking for an organization which has X or Y. Now, include X or Y as being some of the key things you know about the company that you're interviewing with, you're going to get immediate brownie points, right? So if I use Apple there as an example, it's no, uh, I'm just really not, I'm not liking the way in which my company is going forward with their approach to, to privacy and to, to kind of putting the customer first. But I know at Apple, those are two key core fundamentals that you do and, and you build a culture around that, right? Or, you know, you build a culture around internal growth and promotion. The leaders are all promoted from within. So they kind of get a sense of what I will truly be doing day in, day out. And I think for me, that's a more, you know, inspiring work uh, place environment to be within. You're still answering the question. You're still highlighting the fact that 
right now in your role, it's not the best place for you to be. Um, but you're just not saying directly, I don't like working for my boss. Uh, he or she is not a very um, nice person. I hope that answers that question for you. Um, um, thank you so much, uh, Rich. Just uh, as we keep getting more questions and the time is moving, and I know there will be a lot more questions coming your way. I would say uh, we probably need to try and give like quick answers. Um, obviously, uh, we should do our best to provide maximum value. Yeah, that's fine. Let's, uh, let's go to the next one, because I think I can probably leave some of these questions to the end then. So let's go to the next slide, which is talking more about the format, right, uh, and the delivery of the actual answers themselves. So look at the stars, right? Uh, let's talk about the, the star format, situation, task, answer, result. This is so important to do. And this is something where arguably you're not going to be able to truly master or get really good at this without the help of um, someone who knows what they're doing without the help of a coach or a friend who's a recruiter, something like that. You want your answers to be natural. You want your answers to be authentic and true to yourself, but they need to be structured. They need to be structured because at the end of the day, in a behavioral interview, I'm looking to understand your experience. What did you go through? What did you do? What was the end result? So what was your situation and the task? What was your action? What was the end result? And you want to deliver this in a clear, concise manner, which ideally has a strong result. Because as a hiring manager, and I'm typing down your notes, uh, or typing down my notes from this conversation, I really want to make sure I'm understanding the key points. Why was this a tough situation for you? What did you do? And what are the end results? If I don't understand that the situation is tough, the result doesn't sound as good. If I don't understand what you did, well, then how do I know you're going to do the same thing in my company? And then you're maybe just not very articulate or you actually didn't do anything at all. And if there's no end result, well, what happened? Like you may have done all these things, but did the project still fail? Did it actually really annoy the, the client or a customer and, and did it end up being a complete disaster? So that's why it's really important to understand the format. The first thing I recommend people do is write out your answers. Write out your answers, put it, you know, S-T-A-R. What was my situation? What was the task that I had to ultimately do? What did I do? And what was the result? If possible, make the results metric-based. Numbers are easy for pretty much everyone to understand. You improved something by 20%, that's better than what it was. It's 20% better. Uh, you saved $100 million or $10 million or $500,000. These are good things. I understand that versus oh, the process got a little better. What does that mean? Uh, uh, my version of a little better might be very different from your version of a little better. So, so try writing out your, your, your question or your answers or your experiences that you want to call upon. Write them all out and then just verbally practice them, right? Talk them out loud. Uh, get a mirror. Uh, record yourself on the phone. Actually say it out loud and see if it makes sense. Does it sound right? Does it flow well? If you're not sure, Go to Karis and book a coach because they're going to be able to tell you one way or another whether or not it's a good answer or not. But it's really important you get practice doing this. But, and the biggest caveat to this is do not over practice. Do not have uh, your, your screen when you're on an interview with just a script and then you know your resume. And then do not read off the script. We can tell by we, I mean interviewers, we can tell when you're reading off a script pretty easily. Um, it's not going to sound genuine. It's not going to sound authentic. And ultimately, if I ask a follow-up question and you're not prepared for that question, you're going to go from real slick, smooth answer to, uh, uh, I don't, um, well, so, so I don't really, it's going to be really, really obvious. Practice is so, so, so key here. And this then falls up to the next slide here, which is the last of the three pillars, which is all about less is more. This is something which, like I mentioned at the top of the conversation, so many people struggle with. Again, you are not alone if it's you. If you know that you struggle with this, great. If you don't think you struggle with it, no offense, you probably do. Um, and here's why it's important to get this part right. I, as a recruiter, as an interviewer, you have my attention for about 30 to 45 seconds. Truly, that's what it is. If I am not curious in that time frame of what your answer is, how you're delivering it to me, I am going to tune out. 
And it's not because I'm a mean person or because I'm unfair or anything like that. It's just because that to me is a red flag that you cannot get your message across to me in a short period of time or that the actual answer that you're giving is not a very good one. So you have that time period to get my attention. On the flip side, you do not want to keep talking at me with an eight minute monologue of why you love Apple so much, why Apple is the greatest thing in the world, how it saved so many people's lives, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if I work for Apple, I know it's a great company. I don't need you to tell me for eight minutes why it's such a great company. The sweet spot here is somewhere between one to two, two and a half minutes. That's what you should be really aiming for in terms of length of your answer. Guess what you have to do? You've got to practice. You've got to write it on your answer and you've got to speak to it at someone uh, or time yourself, right? We've all got phones that have stopwatches on them, right? Time yourself. Say, okay, this is now too long. Uh, I need to shave off some bits. Use your coach. Hey, can I practice an answer with you? Can you give me your thoughts in the moment? That's what we're here for. This is what we do. Here's why though, uh, when you think about the, the logic of an interview, why it's important that less is more. Let's say your interview is an hour long. The entire purpose of the interview is for me to ask as many questions as possible of you to understand if you are going to be a great fit for my team. If I do not have the opportunity to ask you as many questions as possible, you then have a less chance, a worse chance of me seeing you as being a great fit for my team. If you talk for eight minutes around why Apple is so great, why you're such a perfect fit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, and we use the rule of thumb of two minutes is a good answer length. That's six minutes of time, which I now have lost to ask you questions to find out if you are a good candidate. That's also you losing six minutes of time, uh, being able to prove that you are gonna be a great candidate for this position as well. So every minute truly does count in a situation like this. And so that is why practice makes perfect. Whatever way or, 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 or approach you take, just try it out, write something down and you're gonna be surprised how long it is, um, your answer. And that's why, you know, getting the coaching support, um, again, doing it with a friend, whatever it is, can help you save, you know, literally minutes, which can ultimately allow you more of an opportunity to prove yourself as to why you are such a great candidate um, for this position. Speaking of me talking a lot, we're talking a lot. Uh, those are, uh, in a nutshell, the three key things which I recommend. Listen, we could talk for this for hours, literally, uh, that's my job, to talk for hours around the key elements which you might need support on, the key elements that you can kind of get assistance with, why coaches are great, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those are three key things which I really recommend everyone sort of take to heart and think about. And these are the key fundamentals that every single coach on the Karis platform is going to be able to help you with, whether it's a behavioral interview or frankly, even a more technical one. They're going to be able to help you and then more so, right? So certain coaches will be able to give you, like myself, offer negotiation uh, help to get you 10, 20% more uh, in your offer. Uh, certain coaches who have been former recruiters are going to be able to guide you through the actual recruiting process. How many times might you go, oh, I've not heard back in 24 hours. What do I do? That's what your coach is there for. That's why you can talk to them and say, what do I do? How do I approach this situation? Um, these are all the great things that coaches can provide to you. Uh, but again, these three topic areas are basically what every coach, including myself, are going to be really kind of stressing upon, um, upon you uh, when it comes to getting prepared for your next interview. So you've thank heard you me. Thank you so much. Yeah, I over, think yeah? it's time to actually, thank you so much. You, you've really promoted uh, Karis and our coaches. And I think it's time to promote you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Gonna, yeah i'm gonna allow myself to promote uh rich right now um there is a limited time offer for everyone who is joining us and who'll be watching this live uh also everyone who watches the recording he only has 10 slots available for this package rich i'm gonna give you an opportunity to let them know what 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 they can take advantage of yeah, thank you. So, so like I said, uh, we've got a 
a limited time offer, 10 slots available. I promise you these are not marketing techniques. It's actually true. Uh, I do have a, another day job uh, that I do uh, as my day job. And this is kind of what I do for, for fun and just to help people out on the side. So there's only a certain amount of clients that I can take on at one time period. Um, so with these 10 slots, essentially what you're getting is you're getting me as your coach, right? Uh, I've been a recruiter, a senior recruiter, a team lead, a hiring manager. I now manage a team of recruiters. Um, you get all my expertise that comes along with this. You get uh, insights into the current labor market, understanding, okay, what sort of job should I really be looking for? What are your estimations in terms of what the salary or compensation could be? Um, how do I approach this conversation, et cetera, et cetera. Then you also get three 60 minute virtual sessions with me where we practice everything that I've just talked about, right? We practice your answering questions, your delivery, your star methodology, your timing, and any other questions that you have. Uh, and I'll also include in that a, a full resume review. So this gives you then the confidence to know that, okay, my resume is actually good, right? It looks good. Um, there's a whole, I can do a whole nother webinar on um, the falsities that people say about, oh, how do you get past the ATS tracking system and things like that? It's really very simple on how to do that. So that's included in this as well. But ultimately what you get out of this more than anything else is confidence. Uh, you're going to get the confidence that you know that you're actually going to be probably in the top 5% of candidates that are actually out there seeking help, that are seeking coaching support to get better at what it is that they're doing. If we were having this conversation, I don't know, three, five years ago, you'd probably be in the 1%. Now more and more people are getting coaches to help them. So you're still going to be in the top 5%, but more and more people are getting this. So you want to make sure you're the best candidate when a recruiter speaks to you or a hiring manager speaks to you. This is why, you know, um, people who have the experience like myself can be really, really valuable to you. So, uh, yeah. So like, uh, like Leslie mentioned, I've got 10 of these slots available. Um, you can check out my profile uh, on, on the Karis website. I'm sure there'll be some links to that sent out in the follow-up emails and email blasts. Um, you can see some reviews on there. Uh, don't just look at myself, though. Make sure you look at other coaches as well. Um, and there's a reason for this. I don't specialize in technical interviewing support. So if you need uh, guidance on how to be a great um, you know, coding interviewer when it comes to your data scientist interview, I'm probably not the best person to ask that to. But when it comes to behavioral interviewing, I have quite a bit of experience doing this, uh, and I can guarantee that you'll be more confident going into those interviews. Thank you so much, Ian. Here's the favorite part. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen so that you can actually see us better. And I'll have a look at the questions. The so how's yeah, everyone I'm doing? Uh, I guess everyone is excited to ask their questions per person. I would like to advise you to please ask just uh, one question. We are likely not going to be able to answer all of the questions in the live event itself. But Rich, how about this? Everyone that actually joined us today, what if we don't get a chance to answer all the questions? Uh, what if we offer them a follow-up uh, written reply to some yeah. of the questions? Yeah, I'll do, an I'll do a written FAQ. That's totally fine. Yeah, we can collect the questions and, and do that. I'm, I'm happy to do that. There's not. The ones I'm seeing, there's not too many. We can kind of whittle through some of these pretty fast. So I think we'll be okay. Yeah, it just depends how many uh, more questions we're going to get as the event progresses, as the workshop progresses. So I can see Rajesh's question. We got to answer Rajesh's question. He was the one that we said we were going to do it. So I got to answer it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, one second. I'm going to do the questions for you. I actually, let me see. I see one from him. Yeah. Um, everyone, we're going to give a chance to Rajesh uh, right now because I'm sure he's pretty excited. Tomorrow is his interview at Apple. What kind of role are you applying for, Rajesh? Uh, would be good to know. So here, his question is, how should I answer the question? Why should we hire you? Mm, good question. So... I guess this goes back to being able to tell your story uh, and, and showcasing why you truly passionately believe this is gonna be a great role for you, right? So why should we hire you? Well, because you know I really believe in this company. I believe in the work that you're doing. I believe in you know, this role. I have this many years of experience in this position. Um, you know, 
my experience doing X and Y. So it's not a trick question, right? It's truly, why do you want the job? And, and you have to be able to talk about your strengths in that way, just as humbly as you can talk about your weaknesses. Don't go in there saying, because I'm the best data scientist in the world that you'll ever see, but you want to be able to say, well, you know what? You know, this is why I'm passionately applying for this role, because I believe on my experiences doing this, doing that, because I've looked at your job description, you're telling me you're looking for A, B, C, D, and E. Guess what? I've got A, B, C, D, and E, and I can include F on that as well. Really simply, just make sure you're understanding what the job is and speaking um, to that answer. It's Again, it's one that people try to overthink, but it should just be authentic and passionate around what your reason is to why they believe that you're a great candidate. I think I, you said uh, customer support. Okay, so DevOps. Ooh, DevOps. Okay, yeah. So customer support engineer, right? Think about this. It's, it's a role which focuses on the client uh, or the customer at the end of the day, right? And you're developing new things and you're engineering new things to help them. So you probably want this role because you like helping people is my guess. So that should be your leading talking point. Why should I hire you? Because I love helping people. Because I love um, creating new platforms and new technologies or, or finding ways in which people can get the help which they need faster or more efficiently or whatever it is. Hopefully those are your reasons. So just talk about them, right? Just tell them your reason as to why that's the case. Hopefully that helps. Great, thank you so much. Um... And another one, I'm going to read straight away. Um, so question, is there any key decision-making question that might result in no go independently on other questions answers? Is there any key decision-making question that might result in a no go? Um, there's a few. Uh, I would actually say they're, they're probably more, there are fewer questions that will result in an automatic no-go as it is behavioral things that we see in an interview. So, um, I mean, the weakness one is one. If you come and say, I don't have any weaknesses, uh, that's a no-go. You, you're, not, you're not perfect. Superman's not perfect. No one's perfect, right? So that means you're not humble. That means you're not self-aware. That means you literally have never, maybe you don't perceive yourself as ever having failed in life when we all have failed at something. Um, that is probably an automatic no-go. Um, but you know, from a skills perspective, uh, your inability to communicate, again, your inability to build rapport, your inability to make me want to talk to you, frankly. Um, most companies now are looking for a competency that is, it's called a variety of different things. Some companies call it executive presence. Um, some people just call it communications. Um, it's essentially your, your ability to actually communicate. And it's the probably the number one biggest turnoff is your resume can be great. You could be the, the best, um, you know, the best customer support engineer, right? In the entire world. Uh, but if you, if I can't have a conversation with you, I'm not going to want to hire you uh, because we all work in a world now where we have to communicate with other people. Uh, and so that's just so important. So communication, not showing weakness, being arrogant, even in sales roles. I've hired for loads of sales positions and you think sales, type A alpha personalities. I want someone who's a go-getter. I do want that, but I want someone who's also going to learn from their mistakes and who's going to be humble in how they approach some things. So I think those are some of the key things to look out for uh, when it comes to um, key decision-making you know, questions. Um, uh, but again, it's almost less of a question, more of how do I see you and view you in the actual interview itself? A good question. Thanks, Rich. And we have another one, which I'm wondering if we don't want to turn into a kind of written reply or, a, I don't know, maybe you want to write a blog post even on this topic. Can you offer a couple of additional examples on, uh, on how to answer the weakness question? So this, this one. <laughs> Who's asking this? Jan, I apologize if I got the name wrong there. Jen Boyd, yeah. This the, the fact that you're asking that question makes me think that you're a little bit maybe apprehensive about giving an honest truth around what your weaknesses are. The best way to answer that question is to be very authentic and honest about what your weaknesses are, right? You want to always make sure that whatever weakness you say, that there has been some sort of work or improvement based on that, right? So it's not just, I'm terrible at time management. 
<laughs> okay, well, I don't want to hire you. I was really struggling with time management with my clients and stakeholders for a number of years, but I went out and sought that feedback around what I could do to get better. And it was actually a mentor of mine who said, hey, you know what? You're, like, you, you're just kind of all over the place. You're a little scattered. You're a little this way and the other. Here's some tips and tricks that you should use to get better. And so I've been following those tips and tricks. And, you know, I can honestly say it's not maybe a strength yet, but I'm much better at time management than I was in the past. That's a good way of, of sharing that. Um, but it has to be authentic. Don't make something up on the spot. Please don't make something up on the spot. Because if I'm going to ask you follow-up questions and you can't answer my follow-up questions, I'm going to know you made it up on the spot. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll put pen to paper on some more of those because uh, that could definitely be um, a blog uh, or a, a follow-up FAQ question. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And right now we're actually featuring uh, blog posts uh, quite a bit. We have a new content creator who's supporting all of you guys, the coaches. So you're going to receive help from a professional content creator. Please uh, answer this question in detail in a blog post for us. It would be great for everyone here and mm -hmm. everyone who joined Garris over the next few months. So next one. Uh, how should we answer where do you see yourself in the next five years? Well, where do you want to be in five years, right? What are your goals? Do you want to be a leader? Do you want to be a subject matter expert in your field? Again, whatever your answer, whatever your beliefs are, that's the answer. So, you know, for me, if someone was to ask me this question, it would be, you know, I'd love to be in a position where I can truly help as many people grow and develop uh, as humanly possible, while at the same time, you know, gaining the, the skills and experiences that I need to challenge myself mentally. That's my answer, because it's deeply personal to me or where I want to be in five years. Things to avoid for this question would be, well, I'd love to get the experience here for two years and then leave to go to Tesla. That would be a bad example of how not to answer that question. Um, uh, your pay and PTO are great, so I just want to make the most of this uh, while I can before I go somewhere else. Another bad way of doing it. But there's probably a, you probably have a life goal. You probably have an idea of where you want to be in a dream state within five years. That's your answer, right? Talk about it. Again, be yourself. That's the, probably, forget everything else I've said for the last hour. Being yourself is the most important thing. And if you're being yourself, these answers are going to come much more naturally to you uh, in terms of being able to then deliver them uh, confidently. And, and for a hiring manager to say, that's great. Why do you want to grow and develop people? Why do you want to, why are you, and Rajesh, I saw that you said you're customer obsessed, which I love, and Apple will love that, by the way. Um, why are you customer obsessed? Oh, so in five years, you still want to be doing the same job, but, you know, just being better at it? Great. That's totally fine. Believe it or not, I, I literally interviewed a candidate today who uh, mentioned, you know, I really actually don't want to get into leadership. I just want to get loads of more experiences and be the best, you know, position uh, person that I possibly can be. That's awesome. I, I'm, I'm, I want to hire someone like that. That to me means a lot. I don't need someone to say, I want to be a director. I want a VP. I want to do this. I want to do that. Just be authentic to yourself and, and be truthful. You're muted. Thank you. Um, we have like more than 10 questions for sure. And mm. yeah, I, I expected that that's what's going to happen. Uh, let's try to answer a couple more and the rest, I guess, uh, we'll have to provide a written reply to. And of course, anyone can actually get a chance to meet Rich for a 15 minute free call um, before deciding to book a package. You're offering the free calls, right, Rich? I am offering the free calls. I, I do want to, there is one question here, which I think is super important that I want to make sure I talk to. Um, and it's not specifically related to behavioral interviews, but um, it yeah. is. Uh, yeah. Sanat Kumar, I apologize if I got your name wrong. Um, but the question is, how should you, how should you answer um, questions on diversity and inclusion? As a hiring manager, how do you make sure you're getting diversity candidates? I'm preparing for engineering manager roles, great roles. Um, and I find this topic very, very delicate. It is a delicate topic, right? There is no way around this. But as a hiring manager, I am right now currently, there are certain things which you can control and certain things that you can't control. 
the biggest thing that you can control when it comes to being uh, aware and making sure that you are being open to diverse uh, and inclusive talent is by removing the biases that you may or may not have. Uh, it's the biggest reason why, um, well, it's one of the biggest reasons why a lot of companies have diversity issues is because a lot of people unfortunately have a bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, they have a bias. So the first step is understanding that you may or may not have a bias and then working to remove that particular bias. There are certain industries where um, the this pure statistics and the data shows that there might be more uh, male candidates than female candidates or more um, Indian candidates versus Asian candidates, right? There, there are just, there are realities that we have to face, but in order to be an inclusive hiring managers, we have to make sure that we are removing bias from all of our conversations. So, you know, preparing for a conversation like that or an interview where that is brought up, that is the important thing. So you, you just want to be very matter of fact in that, you know, it is important that we are removing barriers to entry for all types of candidates, no matter race, creed, sexuality, or things like that, but being very open and honest about saying, hey, you know what? There are problems out there, but myself, I try to remove any and all biases from my conversation. That I think is going to, you know, uh, showcase you as a, as a strong and impartial candidate for a role that might have to do um, hiring. So I just wanted to make sure I, I talked about that because it's a really, really good question. You're muted. Uh, thanks, Rich. I just shared in the chat the questions that we are uh, were asked in the Q and A, and we're not going to be able to answer live. But uh, Rich, uh, what do you think? Maybe you could provide a written reply over the next two weeks or so. Yeah, if we keep, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. We if we keep some of these questions, uh, if we can copy and paste them somewhere uh, and you send them over, I'll make sure I do a, a written reply to all of them. Uh, they're going to be saved automatically, anyways, uh, oh. in the chat of the recording. But just in case, I will ensure that uh, I have a copy of everything here. Don't worry. Okay, so. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I mean, if you stay for a second, I could show you how to book Rich, for example, or anybody else uh, on our platform. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. That Let me just make sure I did the presentation. Great. So thanks so much for joining and stay with me to show you around Keras for a second. Also, I'll show you where you'll be able to read your answers. We might actually make a blog post with, with the answers you create, Rich. Would be, yeah. nice to try, would be nice to try something new, right? Yeah, I like it, let's do it. Great, okay, so let me just share. I see we still have, well, quite a bit of people dropped, but we still have about 30 people. And this is uh, where as logged in, you can find coaches. And if you go and you just wanna find Rich, this is where you go and you can book a free consultation or message him directly. And right here, you're going to find the package that he has live workshop special 10 percent off and of course if you're interviewing at a different company you can just go right here to find a coach and then you can decide on what type of coaching you're looking for and which company and we have here some of our top coaches this is teresa uh, which mentioned her in this workshop all of these coaches are incredible as you'll see with the reviews um we have about 45 active, like daily available coaches on the platform. There are about 250, nearly 300 coaches that we have approved. All of our coaches are vetted. So I just want to show you that very, very quickly. And we'll ensure that we answer your questions over the next couple of weeks because Rich is on a pretty busy schedule. He loves helping people. If you can do it earlier, great. And I'll send you, uh, I'll send everyone a newsletter with his answers. So 
this is from us. Thank you so much for joining. Rich, any final words? No, that's it for me. Really appreciate everyone's uh, attention. I know that we probably went a little longer than we thought, but uh, I like to share as much as I can to try to help out people wherever possible. So yeah, like Desi mentioned, any, uh, any other follow-ups, if you want to book a session with me, free meet and greet, things like that, feel free to. If you're confident to say, hey, I just need the support, you can book the packages directly. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I look forward to hopefully uh, chatting with some of you all in, in the near future. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for uh, participating in this uh, workshop. Really, it was great. I can tell that you're working with your heart, which is another reason I absolutely love working with you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and good night to uh, everyone in Europe. Thanks, everyone. See you all later. Yeah. Bye.